you have any new faces here? Everybody's familiar with the rules. Yes. Two basic rules. One person at a time, or they say one fool at a time only. Try to maintain some decorum here. And no, no personal, personal insults or verbal attacks on anybody. Yeah. Okay, so let's try to keep it civil right now. Let's welcome Charlie Paydock to the lectern to start this up. Uh, all right, let's see where we're at. Um, I put together a relatively brief uh, voter's guide to assist you in making your selection. Early voting has begun, most of the police stations, but nevertheless, the number of you have named me. It's, uh, and I believe there is a significant number of undecided voters in this. There's five principal candidates running for office, and I put together a thing looking at each of them, the pros and cons and some other data, to assist you in being uh, an educated voter if you're among the undecided. Let's see here. Okay, All right. uh, you can see, uh, I always collect to see who's got the best looking logo, but I'll let you guys choose among those. Uh, but those are the five principal candidates. There are three minor candidates and the libertarian guy. So you've got five altogether. Uh, let's see. Okay, you don't have to read all this because I'll go through a lot of this, but one of the interesting features of this campaign is that 25% of the campaign funds came from just four individuals are financing these and four these campaigns. Two for two for Honor, one for Pritzker, and one for Ives. So Republican is there's just four guys, and there's a lot of money being spent. We'll, we'll get into that. This is, this is the most expensive governor's race in the history of the United States. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. This has proven to be, there's more being spent on this on a per capita basis than any other race in history. That's why it ended up, it could break the spending record of 280 million sent by California in 2010. Now California spent, and California, we only have one-third the number of voters they're trying to influence, so, okay. Let's see. Now we begin by going to, I divvy this up, and to the Democrats and the Republicans to help you out there, okay? And just to show you what the Republican Party is up to in the state of Illinois, uh, they're having a fundraising, I saw a, I got a notice for this. Uh, there's, there, there's, people think they may be, they're, they're up and they may, that they were down and out. Uh, and there's this democratic surge, but they're doing a fundraiser, and for a minimum of 500 bucks, you can get a ticket. You want to spend 50,000 bucks, you can have dinner uh, with the gov and uh, featured speaker. This gives you some indication of where their pol political politics lie. Their guest speaker is Governor Scott Walker. Uh, All right. Now, a little bit of a history lesson there. But Governor Warner won the 19, the 214 gubernatorial election. And he claimed he had a 44-point agenda. And he was going to shake up Springfield, just like the president's going to shake up Washington. <laughs> and he's essentially a pro-business anti-union legislative agenda. And what I mean, it, yeah, it was largely anti-union all the way. But Democrats, led by Speaker Michael Madigan, whom I met last week, by the way, but they had no interest in negotiating any of these. I heard they, he said they might accept one of them, they, with they looked at, of all 44. But they, he couldn't get any of this stuff out of committee. So it was, especially the anti-labor legislation, uh, never made it out of committee. Uh, they seemed to take a strategy of letting it ride out in the hopes that 
there would be a new governor elected this time around. Okay, let's see where we're at. Uh, why would he want this 44 agenda? Why would that appeal to people? Well, this is a very fresh poll. This was just last week. And people were asked, generally speaking, you know, do you think things in the country are going in the right direction? Or are they off track and headed in the wrong direction? But 20, only 27% said nationwide the country's headed in the right direction. 64% said the country's headed in the wrong direction. They've got a pretty negative, dark view of, of the people running government right now. Now, when it came to Illinois, the figures were even more egregious. More egregious? More egregious. All right. In the state of Illinois, 84% of the uh, people stated that the government was off the track in Illinois. So there's enormous uh, dissension here uh, regarding operations of our state government. Okay, a little more history here. Uh, and you are all aware of this, no doubt, unless you've been living someplace off uh, remote from uh, the rest of us. But of course we had no budget until quite recently. From July 2015 to July 2017. Uh, many institutions and state programs were shut down and uh, independent contractors uh, were taking the government to court to make the state pay. The end product is the budget was ultimately passed after 15 Republicans defected from Rauner. Now Rauner affected discipline within the Republican Party because he's, he's indicated when he came in the office, that if anybody opposed him personally, you would be, be primaried out. He would personally run a candidate against you. Even if you're a Republican, if you, if you vary any way from his authority and his decisions on how to vote. So this was the thing that was controlling the Republican Party. And one of the reasons why we ended up with this stalemate. But the ultimately, the United, the state of Illinois is borrowing uh, $16 billion to pay for the back bills on this. That's so costing us. Okay, what else here? Now, the other thing about, you heard some talk earlier about campaign financing. The candidate said she's not taking back money. Uh, I don't know if Browner's taking much back money, but he doesn't need to because he gave 59 $55 million uh, for his own re-election effort, making up the lion's share of the $75 million he has raised for primary elections. That's a lot of money. Uh, however, state records show that his contributors have gone down. These are the really big contributors of a quarter billion or 25,000 bucks or more have gone down from 35 to 10. So that's, at least for Mr. Rauner, looks like he's losing support there of the big shots, which I know concerns all of you. Now, at the meantime, he's taking in all these big meetings and had $500 ticket dinners. This is from his website. Mr. Rauner, Governor Rauner says, despite everything, I am the same man I always have been. <laughs> I drive a 20-year-old camper van. I wear an $18 watch, and I actually I got an 18. I got a 50. Actually, I, I was in Maxwell Street. I got this for 10 bucks. He wanted 15, but it was cold out. And I asked this guy's daughter, and she said, "All right, 10 dollars." So. Anyhow, he wears an $18, and he says, "I stay in the cheapest hotel room I can find when I'm on the road. All I do is I hunt birds." I hike, I love riding my Harley, and I jump at every opportunity to fish. He's just a real nice guy. He's a real sports guy. Yeah, what can I say, yeah. Now, another thing that came out, you may or may not have seen this, it got some attention, at least around Illinois, that there was a feature article in the National Review 
pretty good publication. Actually, some articles in there. But nevertheless, they featured this story determining that he was, in fact, Charlie. the worst Republican governor in America. Did I, just, did I just hear you endorse the National Review? I could say you could look at it. What was the question? <laughs> the, uh, all right. One of the things Mr. Rauner wanted to do uh, and didn't come to fruition was that talk about his anti-labor agenda. I just wanted to have to say it. He actually wanted to have municipalities set up right-to-work zones so they'd go non-union. And local communities, he said, we should be able to decide how best to compete for jobs and choose reforms that can make their economy stronger, help their businesses and grow the freedom to individual workers to support a union at their own discretion. The only thing I don't understand about this, and he touted this as a major piece of legislation is, is that anybody is any familiar with labor law and right to work knows it's determined on the basis of states. You can't have municipalities declaring themselves right to work, cities or township. It's all done on a state basis. Now, why they didn't do any research into this, it's a pretty common thing, bit of information, but I really think, I had to wonder how they could make a mistake of this magnitude on this premier aspect of his 44 agenda that is maybe not so, so well thought out are just mean-spirited, that they had no concept of labor law. It was just union busting. Anyhow, that takes care of Mr. Rauner. Give you some pause to thought and think about it. I know some of you are already convinced you're going to pull the lever for him, right? He's one of us. He's a real nice guy. Just likes to do a little on the fishing, right? He may have a lot of money, but outside of that, he's a good guy. Hey, let me get the talk, all right? Go ahead. The next one, <laughs> I like her very much, is Miss Ives. Whoops. There we go. Yes. And she's pushed. This is, I like this candidate. Good. She's pushed Illinois further to the right than Rauner and the other Republicans. And she has criticized Rauner for failing to embrace Trump. <laughs> oh my time. god, he didn't think of Mr. Trump. Now, if you go to her website, she actually has posted a book. You can get a free book what, about ripping in the Governor Rauner. I can't say I spent a lot of time reading about it, but nevertheless, you can go to her website and you might be interested. In terms of her background, that much experience. She's only in her third term. She's got five years experience. Uh, she's got a, she's an anti-tax person for the most part. She's a West Point grad she keeps talking about. You know that's one thing I got I started thinking about this and I'm awfully sorry but the military academies are not top colleges <laughs> academically. They really aren't. I don't know. I. I don't know who thinks this is great, but they're not. You get like maybe some kind of general engineering degrees. I've known people who've gone there, and they're not. And they like military history things, and they're not. They're not up there. This is, they make a big thing out of this, and I really don't know why. It's tougher to get in a lot of colleges than it is. There, I believe you and me, I know this. Other. But anyhow, she swears because of this, she says she's on, she's as clean as the driven stove. She says, I live by the code. I was taught at West Point. I will not lie, steal, or cheat, or tolerate those who do. That's like me. I admit it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, the one thing, I actually did see this. And I'm sorry because I don't have sound, but if you go on the YouTube, it isn't all that great. But she has distinguished herself unquestionably by having the weirdest 
campaign commercial in history. And I've even made a collection of these and posted them on our website previously. But this one would rank way up there, if not at the top. But anyhow, she had a teacher, we had a different spokesperson, and they were thanking Rauner. So you had an African-American woman representing school teachers, and T was thanking Rauner. Thank you for school stuff, you know. And a guy in the hood who was supposedly an illegal immigrant, and he was thanking Mr. Rauner for his policies in favor of illegal immigrants. And then he had a, a pink woman in a pink knit cap, one of them feminists, and she was thanking Rauner too. I thank you, Mr. Rauner, for your things for women. And, and then the wildest one of all was this a deep person, transgender person, thanking Mr. Rauner that he or she could now use a woman's restroom. But it, this is the why. This is strange. There were all kinds of complaints about this from all over the place, and it was pulled off. And I'm somewhat surprised it's even still on Facebook or YouTube. That was but, her. That uh, was her. That was her. Had to get her name out there. Yeah. Did you see was, the next one? It was. It was extreme. Uh, Did you see the next one? After uh, that. Now the other thing that's kicking around to me, things about her is that she's, uh, the next one is, they're trying to figure is the Madigan guy taking orders from Madigan. That she's a Madigan man and not really uh, a true Republican uh, doing that. Oh, one other thing, I have a little aside here. I like to take one issue and see how the candidates uh, conduct themselves or make their statements on it. And I was looking at Amtrak, and you may or may not be aware of it, but there's been talk for many years. The only place there's not an Amtrak train is directly west to Rockford and the Quad Cities. And it's been talked that the rest of the state has Amtrak routes. It's one of the only states that has so many extensive routes available. Lincoln Service, they call it. Um, uh, so it's the one little spot they've been talking about. Now, when Quinn was in office, the federal government approved $230 million grant to build a, to, to connect that line, to uh, make it a, a suitable for passenger rail service uh, to Iowa City. And Governor Quinn even committed matching funds. Uh, when Rauner was elected, uh, the, uh, he put um, the initiative, initiatives like this, uh, whoops, I should have had this, whoops, there we go, I didn't show you this, yeah, anyhow, there's Madigan uh, and the woman, but uh, Browner had nevertheless uh, got rid of this initiative. Um, amazingly enough, he was in the Quad Cities last week, and now all of a sudden, He's in favor of this railroad train. He changed his mind. Since he was out there campaigning, he said, oh yeah, I like this site. Not only are we going to have a train, Mike, he said it's going to be a uh, high-speed rail. So not only before you didn't get no train, now you're going to have not only a train, it's going to be a high-speed train. See, my kind of guy, he's coming through. That's what they call it. Yeah, the sure, Bill. Anyhow, the woman was out there, eyes we were talking about right now, and she says, oh, this is not a priority for her. Like, transportation in the state of Illinois is not a priority. Well, tell me what is, lady. All right, let's get on to that. Let's see what these Democrats are up to. You know? Yeah, I'm going. Let's see what they want. Give me, give me, give me. Let's begin with this lefty guy here, Bliss. All the lefty organizations have gotten in line for him, so they kind of like him. Oops, there we go. Lefties for Bliss. And he sees a little bit more to the left than the other guys will see, but he is a candidate from Evanston, uh, was a state rep, now state senator, 
been in office a couple of years. Anyhow, he's, these are uh, that's the National Nurses Association, kind of an activist group. Move on in our revolution. Uh, this has also got the choice of the environmental organizations. I see we got some green people here, but he's always received the 100% rating of the Illinois Environmental Council, uh, which is a major scorecard <laughs> on that. Now, one other thing I have to compliment him on his website, because a lot of people don't look at these. Sometimes they're not particularly substantive. The other candidates have eh, not really much on it, but nevertheless, it's a very detailed analysis of his opinions and views on each of these topics. So, if anything, he gets an A plus for posting that on his website. Uh, anyhow, I, there, there you go. He's got 100%. What grade do you give him for trying to reduce the state retirees? I think we have someone who's chairing the meeting, right, Andy? This guy talking out, right? You tell him, Charlie. Yeah, you got to wait till we're done, Mo. What about the question? The rule. The rules are just not question? the question, period. All right, then we'll get to it. All right, anyhow, Biss has done that. Uh, let's see what else. Here's the statement. He said, no, he said, I'm a long shot. Uh, I don't have Pritzker's money, or Kennedy's fame, or the establishment endorsement. But he, he, he says we've got a, a hunger for activism. That's what I mean. He's appealing to the left uh, and the middle class voters here. This is one of these, I'm not a big shot kind of guy. Well, he's a nice guy, all right. Uh, you're doing this line here. Uh, this is now an issue in this campaign. Uh, or wealth, or the lack of it, has become a campaign thing. And I was thinking about that coming here. I'm a, even if I had a lot of money, I think I would still be a nice guy. It wouldn't, wouldn't make me. But anyhow, uh, I still would be an okay guy. Yeah, but anyhow, everyone's fighting to be for the middle class, which is good. Uh, it's better than fighting for the 1%. Can't fault that. Um, but anyhow, this is in fact a race that includes a couple of millionaires and a billionaire. And he likes to tell people that he only gave his campaign 25 bucks. Anyhow, let's move on to the third candidate. Now, I don't know, you got, you got, you got, a uh, couple of couple we covered already to think about. So I'm going to throw one more at you. Mr. Kennedy came to Illinois in 86. He worked in agri business, which I know where the Greens aren't too favorable of. But he did some good things and has been involved in. Uh, he runs Top Box Foods, which is a hunger relief nonprofit. They deliver foods to the neighborhoods, and he previously served, and I know Frank's been out there, chairman of the Chicago Food Depository, which many of you are familiar with. He also managed the Merchant Whoops. I, I screwed that up. Anyhow, we'll move to Ms. Kennedy. This is it. Uh, he also ran the merchandise market most people are associated with. He's uh, also involved in real estate development, and uh, as I said, he worked earlier in agri business, and he serves on board of directors. So, okay, a little bit more about Mr. Kennedy. He says he's a Ted Kennedy Democrat. Uh, he's received endorsements of the Chicago Tribune, and. Uh, Garcia, Mr. Garcia endorsed him, uh, positions himself as an anti-establishment candidate versus the millionaires, Madigan, and Emmanuel. So this, he's got and also an eight-point plan for gun control. Oh, one other thing I wanted to add, I discovered this about it. He had served as um, chairman, of, you don't have to read all this, 
he was chairman of the University of Illinois Board of Trustees, but he fixed tuition increases at below the rate of inflation. And in essence, he was cutting, cutting tuition uh, for students there. Um, and uh, he, he generated $100 million in new aid for students who couldn't afford full tuition. So he did some good things there for the, the middle class, not just thought. And the next one, we'll move on, is our last one, our last major candidate. I know you got a lot here to absorb a lot of information here, but I know you guys and gals can handle this. But there we go, the Mr. Pritzker, and he's uh, he's uh, more in line with the established Democrats here. So you can see uh, Tammy here and Mr. Durbin there. Uh, Pritzker family, of course, uh, they're venture capitalists. Most of their money comes out of the Hyatt Hotels. They're in all sorts of activities, um, but they're near the top of the wealthiest families in the United States. Despite having this wealth, they are very philanthropic. As you may be aware, oops, uh, you may be aware of some of these institutions around the city. I didn't know they had given quite as much around, but I knew about the pavilion and things like this. I have met. The old lady, Pritzker, she's a pretty cool lady. I liked her. She's a square shooter, you know. But, yeah, not a holy ploy. You know, but she's, she's pretty cool. I liked her very much. Um, but anyhow, they have helped what they thought. Now, another thing is, some people are looking at it in the labor community. Not a lot of noise, but there is some things out here that they haven't had very good labor relations um, at the uh, Hyatt Hotels. And Bliss was making a campaign, a shot of this, and he was saying the people deserve better than being told um, that their anti-union behavior at <laughs> the Hyatt Hotels. Now at the bottom it says, Pittsburgh is an heir to the heir I told Fortune, but he has no real role in management. Not an apologist for him, but he had no real role in the management. They have a lot of money spread over all kinds of businesses and industries, and he runs other businesses. So I don't think it's really, I, I, didn't, I didn't find enough to peg him on this for having any culpability for it. No doubt he is to some extent, but it's not that big an issue. Later on, I discovered, though, that when I was at the meeting last week in Springfield, uh, but he has received the endorsement oops, of labor organizations. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, Governor Rauner wanted to do, that's what I mean, this guy was really against unions. And this is uh, somewhat like the Davis-Bacon Act, but Rauner wanted to prohibit the use of labor con labor agreements on any state-funded project. This guy is wild, let me tell you. He had an intense, intense dislike for organized labor. Really deep-seated, man. He has other thing he kept kicking around was like workman's comp was this big thing. I, it's not an issue. Workman's comp to me had never anywhere was like a big deal, but to him, he had to get rid of it. I don't know why. It was operating pretty, pretty good. It was not. There was anything wrong with it. It was the one thing I've never heard anybody express any concerns. He was involved in like I have been regarding the operations of the workman's compensation program. This guy came along, said it was the worst possible thing that could be, and I'm going, what? I don't know why he targeted it. It's just a strange guy. But anyhow, he wanted to get rid of labor, but um, now here's, uh, here's one thing uh, that explains, it's probably the most important slide in this whole thing, is that Pritzker realized he was an unknown, and quite admittedly does not have government experience, as do some of the others. Uh, 
Now, for a while, this worked. He was putting his commercials out because neither Biss nor Kennedy had money to run their own ads against him, so he had, he had the playing field all to himself. But Rewilder came along and acted like a super PAC for Biss and Kennedy. Um, and spreading a fortune on anti-Pritzker TV. So this gets really involved. You've got the Republican coming in, working for two Democrats against another Democrat. Figure that one out. Browner's idea, though, when it comes down to it at the bottom, isn't to really kick Pritzker out of the race. He doesn't think he can totally do that. But he wants to um, turn him into a bruised candidate, so to speak. So he's a weak candidate for the general election. So that's basically the lead out. And you see all the ads. You don't know who's paying for them or what, but they're all there. All right, finishing up. We're almost done, Tim, so you can relax. And we're here fairly up the tail end. I just wanted to cover briefly. Three additional candidates, Robert Marshall, um, I believe he has, these guys are from out of town. The only thing I could, the only thing I could find out about Robert Marshall was uh, You might want to advance the slides, Charlie. Oh, whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go, we're tailing up the end here, the horse race, there we go. But Bob Marshall, he just wants to legalize uh, we'll, we'll cover a little bit more about Mr. Marshall in the next slide. But he wants to sell marijuana. He says the state of Illinois could sell marijuana. And now hey, we could reduce property taxes. I guess we're going to sell an awful lot of marijuana, though, to reduce property taxes. <laughs> They're the principal source of income. Right? You know how much marijuana we got to sell? So get smoking, folks. Now uh, the other guy, Teal, is an anti-gun guy. He was in Ceasefire, Illinois. And he says, I like this. He says, I'm the only person running for governor that's going to be a champion of the poor people. He's a genuine guy. I like him. And last of all, Bob Diber. Diber. Diber, is it? Seems like a nice guy. He's just a farmer from Southwest. He's not a farmer. You want to know what he is? No. No. You like to be informed? No. 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 Well, that's typical of the ignorant way of doing things. <laughs> Wait for the Anyhow, I, gotta, I like Mr. Rod Marshall's plan here. But he would solve the... This is a good idea here. He wants to solve our financial problems by dissolving the state of Illinois and replacing you with three smaller states. That's a good idea, Charlie. Chicago, the suburban area, Collar counties, and the rest downstate. So, divvy it up into three places. <laughs> Each state, now, don't feel, this is pretty cool. Each state, we get its own constitution governor and two senators which might cause some interest in Washington, but I guess we got automatically, we declare ourselves statehood. I always thought the federal government did that, but Mr. Marshall doesn't seem to know that. Uh, debts and debts would be divvied up, and each state could handle these problems. And uh, that's a good plan. He's got my, uh, my, my going for it. Uh, Last, this is the last part of the program, so I cover all the candidates. Now, there's one feature I like to look at, like who have they got, not by Republican or Democratic organizations, but who's supporting them out there. Ives has got um, the uh, Family Institute. Uh, these are women's issues, abortion issues, and she's, as I stated earlier, She's an anti-tax, 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 anti-tax. Rauner actually has sought endorsements amazingly of absolutely no organizations outside of perhaps oh, some sorry. Republican township or county things. And even that, only two or three. He's not interested in it. This, you can see, uh, he's gotten some 
parts of the city. Uh, Evanston, North in, in the suburb, New Trier, uh, some ethnic organizations, big ones, move on. Uh, nurses, Northside DFA, Our Revolution, uh, Planned Parenthood, and Sierra Club. So he's gotten some left oriented organizations. Looking at Mr. Kennedy, he's done pretty good. Uh, he's gotten, that's what I mean, some Democrat. Whoops. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we'll go on to Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy it really has no organizational uh, presence. Pritzker, however, has got some heavies. Um, Cook County Democrats, AFL-CIO. Big one, you may not be aware of this, the Democratic Chairman's Association. Uh, I follow them. AFT, uh, I like this one, and his personal pack. <laughs> he endorsed himself. <laughs> it's exactly what Trump did. It's exactly what Trump did two a few times. <laughs> All right, Disney, we're here at the end, though. But anyhow, please be certain to go out there and vote, and vote for Honest Chuck. I'm, I, won't, I won't cheat you. I won't take no money or engage in womanizing or nothing. And yeah, you can see that I'm the projected winner. German paid off. German paid off, unopposed. This is not to make us bump Chuck. I ain't gonna steal. I ain't gonna meet with no Russians, no deals like this. Anyhow, we're gonna have five minutes of open microphone so you can tell us whom you're gonna vote for or whom. We should vote for it. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, boy, Charlie. I'm going first. All right. Well, I hope you learned something. That wasn't too long, was it? No. Vote for Chuck. Watch your, watch your. Uh, before we get started on uh, the second part of the program, uh, can I uh, make a brief announcement? Uh, could I have a volunteer uh, to help count the pennies uh, that David Travis left for his $3 tuition? Not Rick, there. Yes, I'm you can get a bowl or something and go sure. over there and clean that table off sure. and see if there's 300 pennies there for the $3. Mo, well, your head's going to be in the way. <laughs> what? My head is in the way? Yeah. All right, I'll decapitate myself. So Rick is going to take the time over to uh, clean that foot. table off with a bag full of pennies. So, that was the tuition know. for tonight. So, uh, anyway, I, we're, everybody got, probably got 15 people here who want to say something, so. All right, what time is it, Andy? It's, you know, it's about it's almost 7.30. We got, uh, we got time to go about five. How many people want to give a rebuttal on this Okay. Turn off the people think so. Okay, it's so five minutes early. Oh, no, okay. no, no. And that's a dozen and we'll vote an hour, so I'll keep track on the time. No, I just wanted him to have a going to go first and then No, Bo's going to go first. Okay. okay. That way that way we can get the worst guy out of the way first. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, um, there may be a few extras. Just keep them as a chip. All right, Bo, you got it. Give me a second, but don't have to be now. Okay. Is it for any? Yeah. Okay. Politicians are famous. <laughs> We're using the mic, Mo. Wait, 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 wait. You what? You're not using the mic. Here. Let me, uh, let me, uh, adjust it. How's that? You're the judge. Okay. Okay. Politicians are famous for not keeping their promises. Once in a while, you encounter someone like, uh, I trust uh, uh, Bernie. Uh, he's a little, he, he had proven himself in serving in the Senate. In any case, I'd like to suggest a different way of judging politicians. Look at what the life they have led. The life you have led shows where your heart your mind and your soul are. 
If you're good at making a lot of money for millionaires, that's what you enjoy doing, then that's what you're going to continue to do. Because that's what your heart is in. I, I'm not, I don't hate millionaires. Bob Diver has had his heart in not only educating children in downstate districts, but educating them in what we used to call shop. I don't know the details, maybe he was uh, doing some uh, instruction on how to uh, repair cars, how to do computer work. That's what his heart had been in for 38 years. He will institute the greatest program of technological education in the history of the United States, because that's where his heart is. He worked as an administrator, too. There is no program that will be better for reviving the Illinois economy than taking all these kids who are certainly not going to college, they may not even be, they, a lot of them are not going to be able to get jobs. Diver knows several uh, manufacturers and, and shop owners downstate who are looking for people, they can't find people who are qualified. That's one of the reasons the jobs are going to, to China or someplace. Bob Diver is the most hopeful candidate we've had for uh, governor since uh, Adlai Stevenson. He will revive the Illinois economy like no one else because he's going he's to tend to our most important resource. It's not oil. It's not uh, uh, stock options. It's children. They're the future, and he knows how to prepare them for that future. And if you want to prepare Illinois for a better future, vote for Bob Diaper. Thank you. All right. Next. You're up, go ahead, you're up. Okay. You're up, Mike. All right. Oh, speaking of jobs. Right. Speaking of jobs going to China. So, you know, everybody thinks these politicians are going to make things better, but. Well, being a Sox fan, they've lost jobs down there already. The Cubs are going to suck this year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Shut up. Am I on YouTube? I'll wait for the camera. Oh. Well, it's not the first time that happens to him, but he keeps doing the same shit. Well, it's because... We never learn. It's the way that... Paul, not... This group of candidates running on the Democratic uh, primary that present such a difficult choice to choose the best one out of Biz, Kennedy, and Diver. It's a problem to decide which is the best candidate. And there's no such problem on the Republican side, and there usually isn't on the Democratic side. But this time, we've really got a good bunch of guys. OK. Go ahead. I uh, I think for some of us, certainly for myself, I find myself underwhelmed by the uh, offering of gubernatorial candidates this time around. Uh, we've got uh, two multimillionaires running. That's not necessarily a mark against them, but uh, it. Uh, my concern has always been what kind of practical experience has the person had for the job he or she is seeking, uh, and uh, none of them seem to be <laughs> extremely, uh, extremely uh, endowed with what's needed for the job of being a governor of what has in the past been one of the worst, one of the most problematic states of the United States. We need somebody who has a variety of attributes that we don't see among these candidates. I'm not saying they're bad, 
I'm not saying that we're going to, you know, we want to boycott the election. I am saying that this is not a time when we're going to have a clear-cut choice. Kennedy, because he is a Kennedy, and because he has run successfully the merchandise march, uh, would appear from one point of view, a business point of view, uh, being a strong candidate. He has had very little uh, experience in dealing with politics, in dealing with communities, in dealing with some of the issues he's going to have to deal with the day he takes office. In the case of Pritzker, again, Pritzker, I'm sure, is very good at making money. Uh, that's not a mark against him, necessarily. I wish that uh, uh, I had the same skill. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, he's not, he's not the most qualified candidate to be governor. Ives is certainly the best-looking candidate, but Ives is a libertarian. Ives is the type of person who would prefer to put government on autopilot uh, and uh, let it go at that. We've got several others who are idealists, but as we remember from the Children's Crusade nearly a thousand years ago, that doesn't necessarily cut the mustard as far as getting things done. So, I don't know about you guys, but I'm torn between I'm torn between Brisker and Kennedy, and I'm not happy about that. Uh, and uh, I usually have a lot more to say. This time, as I say, I'm underwhelmed. <laughs> I have two parts to this. Uh, the first part is about Jane Addams Seniors in Action. Jane Addams Seniors in Action is a 501c4. We can endorse candidates. Uh, we interviewed candidates in September. Uh, and of course, we ignored the, de the Republicans because, frankly, we all thought they were no good. Uh, we sent out questionnaires to all the Democrats. Of those, four returned their questionnaire. Uh, Hardeman's was not complete, and he didn't show up for the interview. Um, this had a superb, in my view, uh, questionnaire, beautifully written. He didn't show up for the interview. He called in later and said, can I come in later? We said no. Uh, Bob Diver did show up. He did complete his questionnaire. He made a good, in my opinion, a good appearance. J.B. Fritzker showed up. He did have a completed questionnaire, and he made a reasonable appearance. On a personal level, I will say this. I kind of liked him. He, he didn't, uh, his uh, suit needed to be pressed. <laughs> okay, but those, we did not endorse any candidate. So that's the first part of uh, my statement. I personally will probably vote for Bob Diver. Reasons, he showed up uh, at Jane Adams Seniors in Action. He was uh, relatively well qualified. I saw him on TV as well. Uh, and I know his senior advisor. So anyway, I, am, uh, I, I agree with Pat. It's probably not the best group of candidates, but I personally will vote for uh, Bob Diver. I got to vote for somebody. Thank you. OK, next. Next. Go ahead, next. We got an open mic. All right. No. Thorium and Oh you did you speak up? Oh yeah. Okay, go ahead. To be honest with you, my yard signs today were delivered to my house for Jeannie Ives for governor. Oh. Uh, and
and I think she would probably be one of the best candidates for governor. If you look at her website, she has raised five kids, but did several tours of duty in the military, still has a successful marriage after a number of years, and she may be just a beginner in the legislature, but she is sticking by her principles. I normally don't uh, get excited about midterm elections, but uh, considering some of the stuff that Browner and these other candidates are pulling, I really think that it might be time to take another look at uh, how everything works in this run. I still don't know a lot yet about where my votes are going to be, but I know I'm probably going to be pulling a Republican one. I lean more towards Libertarians, but, you know, being in the stronghold of McHenry County, that's where you get a lot of the Republican voter. That's uh, a strong Republican county. I will say this, though, over the next couple of weeks, and I exhort everybody to do this, Educate yourselves on the votes, voters. Start talking about it to everybody around how important these midterms elections are. Because like it or not, we're still got some power in this country to make an effect to make an effective change in the way we govern. Several of the I have been very admirably impressed with the way the Democrats have been coming together on uh, Trump. I've also been impressed with some of the Republicans and some of the people who are a little disgusted with the current presidency. But at the same time, I'm also very encouraged to see that some people, the Trump was, they think the thing we needed to get us woke up to start thinking about our values again and what's important in this country. Now, I know you guys know I'm a pro new person, and I honestly think that we're getting scanned with the, with the renewables, but that's my issue, and I've got to convince you about that with firm evidence. I will make one other announcement. It's now been uh, about 35 to 36 days since I quit smoking, <coughs> and I never thought that that would happen. I'll say it here, it was a firm reliance on divine providence that did it. I just got too sick that I couldn't smoke anymore, and after about 10 days when I started feeling better, who needs it? It uh, sounds kind of simple, but there's a lot more involved than that. Thank you. Yeah, boy, boy. raising kids is qualifies one to be If you hear five oh, kids, you got money. five you kids. Oh, yes, five kids. Five kids. 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 What would you spend Thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, as, as always, entertaining, informative, and uh, empowering. Uh, we still have uh, this fear-mongering from the right wing in this country that people are voting in multiple states. Now, uh, that's more national issue, but it's all the same attack. Uh, they scare people on a local level not to vote when they have national elections. And let me just... Uh, illustrate to you what it would look like if we actually did need to spend this many millions of dollars on voting fraud, that would mean that there would be millions of people in cars and buses and trains going over uh, borders of counties and states to vote, and that would be the easiest media uh, story in history. So if you honestly believe that your millions of, that our, we the people's millions of tax dollars need to be spent on voting fraud, uh, you know, I've got some land to sell you on Mars. And if you honestly haven't educated yourself on how much the GOP has spent on gerrymandering, on cross-check, on uh, scaring people that when they've just recently immigrated to the United States legally, that, that might be revoked if they don't vote for the most status quo candidate, um, 
I continue to come back to this same question many, many times, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Why isn't the United States a democracy yet? You know, uh, why is it that easy for a crackpot to get a gun, but it's really hard to vote? So I, I, I think uh, the better angels of our nature have to start to get feisty on this issue and demand that anyone, no matter what race they're running for, local, state, or federal, uh, better be sure the first thing they do on day one is make sure that we actually have real civics and not just feel good, uh, write something down uh, in a polling booth and hope that uh, maybe it was counted correctly. Voting in this country feels like this in the USA with the two major parties in elections. Uh, imagine, imagine you're waiting for a bus, and now I'm a big fan of buses. I, I'm a grandson of someone who immigrated to the Chicago area from Poland in 1901, and he was looking for uh, a, a job, my great-grandfather John Mazurek, and he got to work on the railroads. Public transit is the way to revitalize employment in America. Always has been, always will be. So I'm a big fan of trains and buses and bike paths and, and pedestrian ways and sidewalks uh, as well. So imagine you're waiting for a bus and your first choice is you can choose a bus that has no wheels, just picture this in your mind, it has no engine, it has no roof, and it stands still. But the fare is free. So that's how they pitch it to you. It's a fare free, uh, free fare, and uh, you know, you can just go unlimited. Now the, the other bus that uh, you can get on. Uh, it's a state of the art. It only goes around the block, you know, in a circle basically, like one eighth mile radius of the location you you boarded, and it's two or three times a fare increase from uh, the past price. So that w what it feels like, at least the establishment candidates. There are great local candidates that I cannot be thankful enough to. We had one here tonight who spoke and please support her as best you can. But uh, that's what happens when you have a post-Citizens United Supreme Court ruling America. The J.D. Pritzkers really do think, because they got that much in the bank, that they got that much up here. And it takes a lot of wisdom and a lot of enlightenment and a lot of uh, conviction and a lot of willing to be unpopular in the short term with the donor base in order to be popular with the constituency and long-term base to be a public official in the 21st century uh, for the re reasons we list every week. Henry David Thoreau once said, America is said to be the arena on which the battle of freedom is to be fought, but surely it cannot be freedom in a merely political sense that is meant. Even if we grant that the Americans have freed themselves from a political tyrant, they are still the slaves of an economic and moral tyrant. That's in life without principle. In civil disobedience, Thoreau said, cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence. Uh, so now is the same, now is the same as forever. The future is one, the future is one who remembers. The now and the yet, the new and the next are not separate. Time does not just happen. We are the engine. We got to be the engine. Uh, even if it means somebody like me, as cynical as they come, has to hold his nose and vote for the person I most want to play defense against. Now, I'm not an absolutist. I want to tear down the whole house just because they ruined the most important room in the building. Uh, but you got to be involved in grassroots organizations like Jane Adams Senior Caucus, like whatever you have on your block, even if it's a faith organization that meets. Uh, once every month and talks about it doesn't have to be like this. We're a wealthy state We can have a way of generating this wealth and allocating it to the correct place now If you want a website for that idea, please write this down and tell friends and family and strangers LaSalleStreetTax.org There's a great article in GappersBlock.com from July 15, 2015 by Curtis Black about financial transactions tax there's a great article, July 14th, 2015, ChicagoReader.com by Jen, Ben Jarofsky about financial transactions tax. Uh, we're a very wealthy state and it takes a lot of hypnotist skills from people like Rahner and Madigan to convince us that we're not. 
This last one I'll leave you with is by our uh, probably greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, from our beloved Illinois. Elections belong to the people. It's their decision. If they decide to turn their backs on the fire and burn their behinds, then they will just have to sit on their blisters. Uh, that's my favorite election quote of all time. Thank you, Charlie, for an excellent presentation. As always, Charlie, you are a treasure to Chicago and our beloved Illinois. All right, Andy, you got any stuff to say? <laughs> okay. Um, they don't like success. Lefties don't like success. For those of you that might have not seen the article, it showed up on Common Dreams at the top of the page yesterday. There's a group of religious people in this country called uh, uh, Dominionist, I think is one of the terms. They're far right. And uh, they are putting out the word among all their followers now that it's time to uh, thank God for putting Trump into the White House to lead us into becoming a good Christian nation. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorites. That ranks up there with uh, Thomas K. Jones in 1983. T.K. Jones traveling around the country having high-level meetings with business people who were getting nervous about the nuclear plans for war. And Thomas K. Jones said, there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. Yeah. You dig a trench out back of your house, put two doors across it, leave a hole at the end to crawl into, and then you pile up dirt on the other end, pile it at least three feet deep. Then you crawl in there and sit under that pile of the mound of dirt, and you just wait for the radioactive cloud to drift over and the dirt will protect you. It's the dirt that does it. <laughs> the doctors have pointed, they, a lot of doctors stopped playing golf on Wednesday and formed physicians for social responsibility. They said, here's a man that's, um, he's not in an insane asylum somewhere being treated for a severe mental illness. He's in the president's cabinet. He's an example of what we call insanity on the hoof. Prime beef, as it were. Well, Trump, has assembled the greatest, most concentrated group of swamp things in our government since the founding of this nation. Every one of those people that he's appointed, those billionaires from Goldman Sachs and everywhere else, they should be wearing a lapel pin with flashing neon lights that says swamp thing. If you have, he, they basically put out the word, if you have no ethics, no morals, or no conscience, as those things are generally understood, Come on down. The Trump administration has a job for you. Put the guy put in charge of the head of the make the EPA. Get rid of the EPA. Let's just start letting corporations pollute everywhere. Op reopen Alaska, where the Exxon, Exxon Valdez uh, disaster happened. Uh, reopen. Let them start drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and all all up the California coast for oil. We're seeing stuff that is. If you care about the future of your children, and you care about the planet at all, these views are fundamentally insane. They are so far out of touch with any kind of observable reality. Many utilities around the country have just put out the word that uh, they're planning for a near future where many of their customers are going to be getting cheaper electricity off their roof with cheap solar panels. And, uh, than buying it from the utility. As of uh, now, uh, solar electricity with the current price of solar panels, even with the new tariffs and everything else, solar is cheaper than utility generated electricity in 44 states in this country. So we're in the middle of a, uh, the beginning of a rapid green revolution that is not covered by the media. That's one of the things we'll have uh, some fact sheets with uh, three facts apiece of starting points, what we call square one facts that everybody can agree on if they look at the facts. What we have in this country right now is people, is one article call it, um, they are uh, offensively uninformed and aggressively ignorant. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll give a reprints. <clears throat> Phil Rockstro uh, published an article on Smirking Chimp in 2007 and that one went viral. He said, we live in a Disneyland of militant ignorance. 
not only are people uninformed and misinformed, but they're ignorant about it, and they will attack you verbally or sometimes physically if you get up in their face or try to offer any kind of facts that counter these mythological beliefs. So, on April 7th, I'm going to do an updated presentation on the military-industrial complex with the media, the media educational complex, the media medical industrial complex, and how all of these complexes, with the help of the media, are running giant, enormous scams on the American public. And if we, if we begin to puncture those myths, and also begin to demand that we go back to paper ballot, paper ballot voting so that we can have elections where votes are counted, uh, it go, will go a long way toward getting our country back because on the issues, on key issues, about 80 to 85 percent of all Americans are on the same page. But if you ask them, is that a Democrat or Republican view, we're divided. Uh, the press makes it look like we're divided between Democrats and Republicans. We're not. We're divided between people that know the facts and people that don't yet know the facts. There's a lot of good people that supported the Catholic priests until they found out they were pedophiles abusing their kids. That's a game-changing learning experience. Once you step through the psychological barrier and look at the evidence, you can't go back. The, uh, you know, the, the myth of 9-11 is like that. Once you step through the barrier and learn that it was a giant real estate fraud where seven buildings were destroyed that day, and the media sold it as a scripted Hollywood-style event, like a blockbuster movie. 9-11 was a scripted event where the media laid out all the key points of the legend of Osama bin Laden and the legend of 19 lucky Arabs that flew four computer-controlled jumbo jets. Every piece of what we were told about 9-11 has been a fantasy. And as Professor Griffin said, we're not going to get our country back from the direction it turned toward the dark side in 2001 until we publicly disavow that fairy tale myth. That's the most, it's, it's a poisonous tree that was planted in America on September 11th. And then we got Homeland Security, we got uh, airport uh, people taking off their shoes and socks and all kinds of things. The militarization of the police, a lot of the police departments look like uh, military, well they are made up of ex-military people that are home from Iraq and Afghanistan. Why do you think there's so many uh, police now that just come out and draw a gun and blow somebody away that's unarmed? They, that's what they were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was their job, just kill innocent people and clear them off the land where the oil companies want to build a pipeline or uh, you know, dig for oil or control it. So, um, Mark, I'll leave you with well, how'd they do 9-11? What? How'd they do 9-11? Well, 9-11 was a, a giant real estate fraud. The, uh, the, owner, the, the owner of the Twin Towers, or the whole complex, the guy that got the lease, he took out billions of dollars worth of terrorist insurance six weeks before the buildings were demolished by a controlled demolition company. And that's what happened. That's a fact, and people that ignore those facts are maintaining themselves in a state of offensive ignorance. We're responsible for our government. You know, if, if we pay the salaries of people that are murdering people all over the country, all over the world, we have a piece of that responsibility. And that's that's where that's why there, there's progressive people voting, uh, running for office all over this country. And the, the, uh, for those of you that aren't aware of it, the, Dem the Democratic National Committee, the DNC, is doing their best to bury professor, uh, candidates that believe like Bernie Sanders were immensely popular, they're getting elected, and people that are running for office on progressive tickets are being uh, slandered. Uh, the Democratic National Committee is taking out ads opposing them. You'd think we, they would be opposed by Republicans. No, they're, reposed, they're opposed by the corporate fat cats in the Democratic Party that are Democrats in name only. Dinos. They're Republicans that are presenting themselves as Democrats to get elected when actually they're owned and operated by Wall Street. Almost the entire Republican Party is owned and operated by the National Rifle Association, Wall Street, and some of these other groups. And then they have just enough Democrats on the payroll to control the Congress. So 
Charlie, you got a question? Yeah, you like said we it was brought down to demolition, but that doesn't mean very much. And then you went on to, how did they demolish that building? Charlie, all you have to do is what Professor Griffin says, step through the psychological barrier that prevents you from looking at the evidence. The evidence is easy, easy to understand. You need a 30% open mind and a seventh grade education. 30 over 7. You don't need a college degree. You don't need to be an adult. A 7th or 8th grader can understand the forensic evidence. It's easy to understand once you look at it. Uh, it's been published in places all over the world. There's no doubt that all seven buildings were demolished with pre-placed explosives. Those are the facts. Thousands of scientists have been recorded. Thousands of ex-military people, analysts, hundreds in this country, and hundreds from uh, ex-military intelligence agencies all over the world have collectively reported that 9-11 was an inside job to, done to get us and other countries to support the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and taking down other countries to make the Middle East more user-friendly to the oil companies. Yes? Do you mind if I come up and say something about that? Do you want to add to it or rebut it? Well, I just want to tell you my experience of 9-11. Go ahead. Let's, uh, you got time. Well, yeah. I was, I Go ahead. Up to the mic. Go ahead. Up to the mic. Please. You said, how do you set charges in seven buildings? Well, they, 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 they had control of the security company that uh, would let people in at night, and, and a lot of the buildings were money losing. They were three, three quarters empty. All right, let's, let's go. One bomb? Yeah, like a suitcase bomb. You know, I used to substitute, uh, and I was a math and science teacher, and I was substituting in science one day at New Trier. And uh, the, reason, uh, uh, the reason they let a substitute come in there was because they were having movies that day. And um, I, when I, was in high, when I was in college, had worked as a waitress at the New House Hotel in Salt Lake City. And so I knew the New House Hotel. I had worked there. And so that day, I was teaching three or four science classes. And what they were demonstrating that day was a movie of the demolition of the New House Hotel in Salt Lake City, which was amazing to me because uh, it's no longer there. It was demolished. So this was a science lesson in how the charges were placed in the New House Hotel here, there, and everywhere so that, uh, not just here, there, and everywhere, it was a d deeply planned demolition of this building. And they showed the students in this movie how the charges were placed throughout the hotel because they wanted it to fall into its own footprint. And it's like when that building came down, hardly a speck of dust escaped the footprint. It just came straight down. And, uh, and so I watched this movie four times that day because I was, you know, a functionary and it happened to be in those classes that day. So I watched the uh, towers come down in real time. I, I won't explain why, but I was watching television uh, in real time as the towers were demolished. And I thought to myself, wow, they came right down into their footprint just like the Newhouse Hotel. And I felt, I've seen this before, the charges have to be placed very scientifically to make that happen. The buildings didn't fall over. They fell straight down into their footprint, and I had seen that as a science lesson uh, in uh, that day that I was substituting uh, and saw this movie over and over in this building that I was actually quite familiar with. I was raised in Salt Lake. So uh, that's, I, don't, I haven't read all the stuff. And I know there's a lot of stuff out there about the demolition of the Twin Towers and how it was scientifically done and planned and uh, it couldn't possibly have been caused by those airplanes flying into it because, otherwise, because the fire would have gone out, the buildings would have burned for days and days, you know. Uh, so this is not a scientific report. It's just my experience of how I saw that thing happened. And he's right.
<laughs> one final note. Uh, you know, it makes it easy. You can start with one simple fact. It's, it's available on dozens of videos, dozens of sites all over the world. We were told that the Twin Towers collapsed. The Twin Towers didn't collapse. They were converted to dust from the top down. It was a, 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 an optical illusion, magician smoke and mirrors. In a normal controlled demolition, they demolish the, the, the you know, building is, the explosives are done from the bottom at first and then rise up. The Twin Towers were packed with explosives, layers around floor, every other floor or so, floor by floor by floor. They set off, as she said, you need to set off the charges in a very precise manner. So what the firefighters, uh, hundreds of firefighters that survived, they reported seeing layers of explosives going out, boom, 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 and the cloud of dust, the wave moved down the building, make it look like it was collapsing. But as the firefighter said, after after the first tower came down, they're looking where it used to be. He says, where's the rubble? Well, the rubble, 99% of the building, is rolling over lower Manhattan and sideways in the wind is a giant cloud of dust. The physicists had to invent a new word. They said the Twin Towers weren't just demolished, they were dustified. They were what converted physicists? to dust by high, <laughs> high powerful explosives. Find me what what physicists that gave oh, up the dead? A group of physis physicists for 9-11 truth. Oh, People like Albert, like Albert Einstein and five of his friends say the earth is a flat. Dustification is a physical concept? A, yes, when you convert a building to dust, it, it takes way more energy than when you just demolish it like it does in physics. It's basic, basic physics. How do you so, dustify something? With massive explosives. Like this cup, can you dustify it? Yeah, with proper explosives, you convert that to fine powdery dust. Be well, finer, that finer yeah, that powdery. a good job. And Charlie has just given us an example of someone who won't step through the barrier. Like uh, the people that uh, supported the Catholic priests after some of them put out the word that, hey, we got a problem here. Many people dragged their feet until the evidence was so overwhelming that uh, the church had to admit it and start uh, doing something about it. But knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth on many different subjects in America. It just takes time for the lawsuits to come up through the courts. So uh, for those of you that want uh, updated information on stuff that's been going on for 10 years, 20 years, blacked out by the media, come on uh, April 7th. For those of you that like to live in a bubble, uh, avoid that date on April 7th. Go to the beach or something else. Thank you. I guess I'm one of those who haven't stepped through the barrier yet because I'm looking at some of the same evidence that Andy's telling me about, and I'm more convinced that the 9-11 Commission Report is one of the best books on the subject. I'm also taking a look at more of the scientific claims, and where's the, you know, if all these people are involved, why haven't we seen more come forward? One realtor can walk around. And, uh, anyway, enough said. I don't think what we're going to do right now is just uh, leave early, unless anybody else has anything. What? People are already leaving. Unless anybody else has anything left to say. Hey, Charlie, come on, let's go. Yeah, call I'll, I'll call what? the college of conflicts. Oh, wait. All right, Charlie, you got you got some time. We got some time. Can we give second rebuttal? We yeah. can. We can do it. Just a quick one, all right? Yeah. That's fine. All right, just a question here. You said there's a new new process in in, in, the, in the world called dustification. <laughs> the burden of proof is on you. No, it's not new, Jerry. You, know, you said it's not new, but then when did it come about? Isaac Newton time or when? No, in, in 1945 when they dropped the first atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a lot of buildings were converted to dust and vapor. Yeah. So if you have it enough takes explosives. nuclear... Not necessarily, just massive explosives. Massive explosives. Massive explosives. And they're, and it, it, but it, that's just demolition. It's not justification. Well, it turns it, now it turns it to a certain quantity of dust. A dust that'll blow in the wind. If there's no rubble pile left on the ground, we're 100 And they, they've done it. explosive. How much force do you need to take a little piece of matter? 
the physicists have it. Now these guys the took, had enough explosives <laughs> that they could take seven buildings and put this much explosives in seven buildings. One real and well, I'm gonna leave it at this. You don't have to tell me. Now you're coming to speak. But you got seven buildings and you got enough explosives. This is traditional explosives, I guess. Equal to that done by an atomic bomb. The military has. This is wait a minute. You are saying they use conventional explosives. I didn't say that. And they, and they were able to control this bomb that was equal to that, the detonation of an atomic bomb, and they were able to do this in a controlled fashion with a with a fell down in its footprint in Midtown Manhattan. I'm gonna leave you up to tell me how that was done when you speak. The, you tell me how it was done with such precision. They could achieve justi justification. You read what the architects say. Now you say, you're maintaining that they use the blast equal to atomic bomb? Small, small. I right, thank you. All right, Jonathan. Charlie Frank's All right. Uh, what was the topic this evening? Anybody? Does anybody governor. remember what the topic was? This governor evening? of the, this <laughs> Illinois state politics. Illinois state politics. <laughs> so, so and I don't discount the importance of that topic that we just once again revisited. But we got to sometimes, some weeks, just let that one be for the after party or the before discussion. One of the best parts about College of Complexes is getting here at 5 o'clock or even 4 o'clock, as I often do, and have a soapbox before it begins instead of after, like at Occupy. Because uh, it's an important topic and it's a worthy discussion, and sure. I like participating in it. But this is the second Bill of Rights uh, proposed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Every American has a right to, number one, a job. Number two, an adequate wage and decent living. Number three, a decent home. Number four, medical care. And, uh, number five, economic protection during disability, sickness, accident, old age, or unemployment. And number six, a good education, which a good education is sometimes saying no to the official narrative that the government presents you and doing your own research. So there, that's my uh, contribution to the topic uh, that Charlie and Andy uh, are discussing. All these rights spell security and after this war is won, referring to World War II, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. And unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. Uh, elections. There's a whole article in the February uh, 8th to 22nd of this year's Rolling Stone magazine on how the GOP rigs elections with a combination of gerrymandering, voter ID laws, and dark money. Re Republicans have tipped the political scales in their favor Will it be enough to keep Democrats from claiming victory in 2018? So uh, it is very easy to be cynical in these times uh, about both parties, but we need high turnout all the more reason to vote your values if those values are represented by a third party alternative party or a write-in candidate, please, and combined with participating in your local grassroots and nonprofit organizations. Please tell your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, turnout indicates how much you care about the future of your community, your state, and your country. Uh, I don't know exactly how we're doing this now, how much time I have, but it's 8.17, so I'm going to go for at least another minute and a half if you all will indulge me. I was listening to Tom Hartman this week. And Tom Hartman's an important guy to go to because Tom Hartman likes whistleblowers. Uh, but if there's no whistleblower from the inside on a topic, uh, it's like reaching for the highest fruit on the tree. That might be a fruit, a legitimate 
you know, thing worth going for with the highest ladder the whole community can build, and it might be a decoy intentionally put up there by some powerful people because they don't want you to get the low-hanging fruit that you can get peaceful democratic mass mobilization for, for system change. That might be a fruit way up on the highest branch you can find, but it might be a tennis ball or a baseball too. So Tom Hartman is somebody who I deeply respect, and he was talking about this poll done by GBA Strategies Poll, Progressive Change Institute. 79% of people in the U.S. say that they want to uh, allow the government to negotiate drug prices. So we're way more progressive than the Rauners and the Trumps of this country are leading us to believe. 78% of we the people said students should receive the same low interest rates as big banks. Uh, you know, the student loan should be about 1% interest or 2% interest instead of 7 or 8%. 77% said there should be universal free pre-kindergarten education. 75% of we the people said we should have fair trade which protects workers, the environment, and jobs instead of free trade. 74% said we should end corporate tax loopholes which allow corporations to reduce jobs in the U.S. 73% said we should end gerrymandering, very relevant to the election coming up later this month, uh, the primary. 71% uh, should said we should allow Medicare for all single-payer health care. 71% of Americans said we should disclose corporate spending on politics and lobbying. 71% of we the people said the NSA should be required to get warrants before they spy on us, which the candidate uh, rightly uh, pointed out that Quigley is on board with more spying. 71% of Americans said we should spend $400 billion a year on infrastructure. Pretty modest amount as far as infrastructure is concerned. 71% said we should have debt free college at all public universities. 70% yeah, sure. said we should expand social security benefits. 70% said we should have full employment act. So the government is the employer of last resort, like under Franklin Delano Roosevelt with the WPA and the CCC. 70% of we the people said we should have a program to retrain coal miners and oil workers for clean energy jobs like wind and solar. 70% of we the people said we should end tax deductions for uh, fines for Wall Street uh, bankers so that what they pay when they violate the law and rip us off. So end the deductions for bankers. 66% said we should have transparency in trade negotiations. 64% said tipped workers should receive a full minimum wage. So yeah. to our brothers and sisters who work here at Dappers, that's very relevant. Yeah, uh, for you know, they should receive what they generate in wealth and not a fraction of that. 65% say we should eliminate the Electoral College, very relevant to national elections. 63% yeah, okay. said right. we should all community colleges be free. 66%, I'll end with this, all corporate political spending should be required to be approved by uh, shareholders and 59% said we should tax the rich at 50%. Reagan lowered that from 74% to 50%. That's when this onslaught of voodoo economics nonsense began. 59% uh, should we have minimum guaranteed income. 58% said there should be public matching funds for small dollar donations yeah. to candidates. 54 4% said we should tax the rich, and 50% said we should have a financial transaction tax. And you will uh, Did see I get us back on topic? No, you didn't get us back on topic because you'll see a giant sucking sound of jobs leaving the U.S. And I'm going to buy you grapes every day now because they're courageous. When I decide to come up and talk to you, I was very sure of what I want to tell you, but in the meantime, meantime, I walked from there to here, I forgot. So, uh, fuck you all. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a shot, Andy. He's not eloquent, he's sincere. All right. He has the last four minutes. All right. Fuck. It will take less than two minutes, I think. Uh, the perspective on educating our youth, uh, a, the, the crucial perspective is contained in a very brief prophetic statement by Warren Buffett, who said about a year and a half ago, I think, 
that the threat of global warming is greater than the threat of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. That's exactly right. Um, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt did not say, well, if you want to join the Army and help the national defense, we won't charge you a lot for the, your training. The younger generation, whatever they're training to do, whether it be a nuclear physicist or a bus driver, is essential to the operation of the economy and the creation of alternative energy, not to mention the global trade war. They are our soldiers in the global trade war, and this society will collapse if we don't uh, match where the Chinese are training their economic soldiers. So if you bear that in mind, to, to charge people for education is treason. Okay, thank you all for coming, and we're going to uh, adjourn so they can uh, get this area cleaned up, and we'll get out of here by quarter to nine for sure. Okay. Thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. Right. Next week's talk should be very interesting about a new international social movement called the Zeitgeist Movement. Zeitgeist.